Hi everyone, my name is Matt Berkowitz and I'm a member of the global lecture team for the sustainability advocacy organization known as the Zeitgeist Movement, which seeks to educate the public about the systemic root causes of our broadest social and ecological problems and offer a sustainable alternative to our current global market economic system. One more in line with the scientific method. When considering a better, more sustainable world to live in, and what sort of changes need to be made to our socioeconomic system, we also must consider the value shift required by humanity that will make such a change possible. Put briefly, the integrity of our values can be measured by how well its principles align with scientific understandings. In other words, are our values and beliefs supported by the best available evidence that our modern scientific understandings have to offer? The general state of science education in the world today is still in its infancy. Evidence-based beliefs are still superseded by religious, economic, and political ideologies and dogmas that often tend to reject or ignore science. Likewise, there very much exists a state of scientific ignorance and science denialism today by the public. Unfortunately, social change activists seem to be no less infected by this. There is a tendency for those in social change movements who are skeptical of the socioeconomic system to misapply this skepticism to modern science. Some people think that because potential conflicts of interest exist due to the nature of the competitive market system, that somehow all science is corrupt and invalid. This is absurd. This is a talk I've been wanting to do for quite some time. It deviates a bit from past talks of mine, as well as other Zeitgeist Movement related media. However, it is no less important or relevant. The point is to encourage you all to become public intellectuals, to take responsibility for uncovering the very best evidence you can possibly find for your beliefs, and to operate like a scientist in your search for knowledge and understanding. I hope to provide you with some tools in order to be able to achieve this better. Throughout this talk, I will go over some of the key perspective shifts we must attune ourselves to, to refine our research skills. I will describe many of the pitfalls many of us frequently make in establishing our beliefs. And then I will provide some important tools we can all use in order to ensure that our beliefs conform to the very best evidence available. To paraphrase public speaker Matt Dillahunty, I want to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible and I hope you do too. Our values and beliefs do not exist in a vacuum, and as such, they have consequences on the rest of the world. Therefore, it is of paramount importance that we continually update our values and beliefs as our abilities allow us. I will be referencing a lot of material throughout this talk, and I encourage you, like a true skeptic, to scrutinize it all and review the sources. Let's continue. So, how should we approach the methods of evaluating information? What are some important things to keep in mind when assessing the validity of a claim? What should we do before we actually go through the steps of trying to discern whether a claim or piece of information is more likely to be accurate or not? Likely the first thing we'll need to ask is what type of claim is being made or what sort of information is being referenced? A claim that is more easily investigated via experiments and studies likely appears in the scientific literature, that is, within reputable, peer-reviewed journals. And then there are broader claims about social systems that are more difficult to deal with. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus on the former, since the Zeitgeist Movement essentially deals with the latter in its main advocacy initiatives. Of course, the two categories often intersect, and the ultimate goal with this all is to have a comprehensive understanding of as many areas of science as possible in order to directly apply it to our society in a way that benefits us all. Another thing we need to do in framing a question or claim about a particular field of study is to consider whether the field is more easily dealt with in a reductionist approach or a holistic approach, or some degree of both. Reductionism can refer to a few types. But for our purposes, methodological reductionism refers to the idea that complex systems can be understood by breaking them down into their smaller component parts. Holism is more related to systems thinking, 
referring to the idea that complex systems can only be understood when taking into account the interaction of all moving parts, and that by reducing the system down into component parts, you will obscure understanding. To quote Douglas Adams, if you try and take a cat apart to see how it works, the first thing you have on your hands is a non-working cat. Life is a level of complexity that almost lies outside our vision. These two broad approaches don't have to work in opposition, as both have their strengths and limitations. In the best of times, the two should work synergistically, but it is useful to identify where each is more applicable. For example, pharmacology could be thought of as a more reductionist science. The goal is often to test the human, biological, and psychological responses to various drugs in relation to one another. Molecular biology also tends to be classified as a more reductionist science, even though it can be used to answer larger questions. Climate science, nutrition, and astrobiology, for example, could be thought of as more holistic sciences, since they emphasize the study of complex systems rather than focus on isolating individual parts. That's not to say that each of these fields doesn't utilize reductionism on some level, but its usage is more limiting. For the sake of the social change advocated by the Zeitgeist movement and other social change activists, holism or systems thinking is more appropriate as socioeconomics is, of course, a highly complex thing to consider with many interrelated components that cannot be fully understood in isolation from one another. Yet reductionism is still, of course, necessary when testing certain specifics of a theory. It is also worth noting that both of these approaches can be misused. For example, hiding behind the banner of holism can give someone false leverage to make a range of unfalsifiable claims, such as by forming conclusions on broad statistical correlations without testing for causative effect. On the other hand, in nutrition, testing individual nutrients and their effects on the body in isolation may obscure the bigger picture or the bigger question of what is an optimal dietary regime. When consulting the scientific literature and reviewing evidence for a particular claim or subject, one of the most important things we can do is to remain focused on the bigger picture. We need to look for patterns in the scientific literature, rather than individual, singular studies that may not be representative of the overall understanding. Good thinking entails gaining a general understanding from most phenomena. Bad thinking is trying to understand based on the exceptions and anomalies. However, understanding exceptions plays a vital role in understanding limitations of a particular model and building new and improved ones. More on this soon. With that said, let's go first into some of the pitfalls of research that many of us fall victim to. After that, I will run down some strategies that tend to work better in weeding out the noise and zeroing in on the truth, or at least the best available information. Research is most confusing and difficult in those fields in which there are many conflicting monetary interests, and as a result, fields that have a lot of noise about them on the internet. Noise which is then amplified by misinformed or scientifically illiterate citizens. The pitfalls I will delve into next apply most strongly to those fields in which there is at least seemingly no unanimous or near unanimous agreements amongst the experts trained in a field, but they can likewise apply to any field. The first pitfall I want to mention is the tendency for many of us to rely on the media's reporting of science. I think most of us understand the problem with this on some level. The media is an institution in the business of selling news, and the more glamorous, bold, and noteworthy it is, the more attention a media piece will get. The problem is, science simply isn't compatible with this. Science mostly works in very small increments, slowly adding bits of the puzzle to add to the bigger picture. Such small advances are generally not conducive for front page media coverage. So the media often has to distort particular studies or highlight exception studies that are contrary to the general understanding of a field. This sells. And it often doesn't matter the source. It could be the New York Times, MSNBC, The Guardian, or it could be notorious quack science or other ridiculous websites like Natural News, Mercola.com or Infowars. Simply ignore the latter examples, and when reviewing the former, 
see how the reports stack up against what is reported directly by the scientific community. Be cognizant of the deliberate misrepresentation of science under the guise of providing balance for the viewers. More on this later. A related pitfall is to rely on blogs and podcasts for scientific information, and even sometimes books. The advent of the internet has granted us the privilege of easy access to essentially all the information that's been recorded in the history of the world. Unfortunately, it has also brought an immense amount of information pollution. Anyone with an internet connection can become a self-professed expert in anything and spread whatever they want. It should go without saying that these media for information broadcasting often don't go through any sort of expert filter at all, like is done through the peer-reviewed process. While they can be excellent tools to act as platforms for discussion about relevant issues, they should never be a primary source, nor even taken seriously much of the time. Blogs, podcasts, and books are often the preferred media by those wishing to sell a viewpoint that opposes the scientific community, whether for monetary pursuit or some other purpose. It can give the impression that there is serious debate about a particular scientific issue when there is not. Or worse, it can serve as a medium for the irresponsible, untrained layman to cherry-pick data to mislead people to dangerous conclusions. For example, the many ridiculous books out there that claim to be skeptical of the very well-established and unsubstantiated lipid hypothesis which describes cholesterol's role in the etiology of heart disease, give the false impression that there is any serious debate about this within the nutrition science community. There are many similarly ridiculous books about the supposed dangers and lack of efficacy of vaccines and how they have been ignored by the scientific community, spawned by the anti-vax movement. Remember, just because someone has credentials doesn't make them reputable. I find the best way to think about cre credentials is that someone who possesses them will be more likely to be predisposed to having certain knowledge. They by no means qualify a person in and of themselves, especially when making dissident claims. This brings me to pitfall number three, anomaly hunting, also known as cherry picking or selection bias. With the sheer amount of confusion from the information jungle largely caused by the internet making information spreading so easy, many people get suckered into accepting fringe ideas that are dressed up in a way that make them seem plausible and competitive with those accepted by experts in any given scientific field. This often gives way to a phenomenon known as anomaly hunting, where so-called skeptics, or what I will call confusionists, will only reference studies that seemingly support their position, either ignoring or downplaying contradictory studies. The best Confucianists will do this in a way, in a convincing way, that forces you to doubt what is known and agreed upon by the bulk of scientists in any given field. Apparent inconsistencies to an official position or theory will be used to try to confuse or cause doubt about the validity of that position and to discredit good research, when in reality, these anomalies are just that, anomalies, whose apparent inconsistency is really because of some unforeseen variable or lack of soundness in the study. This is a tactic employed by climate change deniers, cholesterol heart disease deniers, evolution deniers, and so forth. These people tend to go out of their way to make sure all you hear are the anomalies and exceptions, and not the mountains of evidence that corroborate the actual scientific truth. And yes, I use the word denier strongly here as opposed to skeptic, as the sheer amount of lopsidedness in the manufactured information war suggests that anyone who rejects the consensus position for these particular topics is really just burying their heads in the sand. Of course, no one who takes these positions will accept such a label, but from any objective standpoint, such indefensible positions can only be preserved by denying the preponderance of information. Now, this is not to detract from the importance of looking for anomalies when testing a hypothesis for validity and reproducibility, which is absolutely necessary. And understanding these exceptions is often how major breakthroughs are discovered in science. But here I am referring to the practice of usually laymen who have no proper training in a field, who spread propaganda that causes confusion about a topic. 
usually from the security of an internet blog or podcast, which is almost always based on a grossly incomplete and lack of understanding about a topic. No doubt we have all been victims of this phenomenon, which is why I bring it up. Pseudoskepticism is a relatively newly revived word often used by those who wish to appear as though they are being skeptical of a position, but in reality fail to actually apply true skepticism. The term can be used correctly to refer to those who call themselves skeptical of a concept but have really low standards of evidence for the concept, or have impossibly high standards that they could never be convinced by any evidence. But more often it is used incorrectly to dismiss legitimate skeptical criticism of one's beliefs as being unfounded. These people often have ridiculous double standards or invoke special pleading for the belief of their choice. This is common amongst people claiming the existence of paranormal or metaphysical phenomena and various science denialism positions. It is also common amongst these people to dismiss all mainstream scientists within a field as close-minded and biased. To quote physicist Richard Feynman, you should keep an open mind but not so open that your brain falls out. One problem I have noticed amongst many who advocate for broad social change and others is that they think that money has corrupted literally all of science and that nothing in the mainstream is to be trusted. They seem to spot a conspiracy everywhere. Yes, money has certainly poisoned a lot of things, including the science industry, as I will discuss later, but it still does a damn good job of weeding out the crap even if some of it falls between the cracks sometimes. What it doesn't seem to be so good at doing is suppressing good science, which usually comes forward if it is legitimate. This pseudo-skepticism often paves the way for such people to become climate change deniers, anti-vaccine proponents, AIDS denialists, alternative medicine advocates, anti-GMO foods due to health and environmental concerns, uh, low-carb or paleo-fad diet promoters, and so forth. Now, I'm sure to have pissed off some people listing all those examples. And my intention isn't to go through any of these examples in any real depth, but I do want to highlight that there is the tendency for people who believe in any one of these things to be vulnerable to believing in many of them. To highlight my point here, and how science is abused and misused by such people, I want to go through a few of these examples to show how these cranks attempt to mislead the public, whether intentionally or out of ignorance. I will do that throughout the next section. Likely the best place to start when reviewing a scientific field or general scientific claim is to review what the scientific consensus is on it, and similarly, what may be said by academic authority organizations on the subject. Scientific consensus is the collective position of scientists within a given field of study, implying general agreement, not necessarily unanimous agreement. It is something that emerges once enough data and evidence are compiled that support a particular model or conclusion, weighed against any contrary data. Consensus is typically established through scientists convening at conferences, the publication process, peer review, and sometimes surveys. Sometimes position papers will be issued to communicate what the scientific consensus is to outsiders of the field, or the general public. It should be noted that scientific consensus is very different from the consensus of the general population. General consensus amongst the population is often ill-informed and not reflective of the evidence, whereas scientific consensus is evidence-driven and materializes when the evidence is strong enough. This is generally straightforward, but it can become quite difficult when there is perceived controversy amongst the public about a particular issue. Sometimes, due to the competitive market system we live in, scientific consensus on a particular issue will directly challenge business interests. For example, as was the case when it was found that smoking causes lung cancer, or that human activity has contributed and is contributing significantly to climate change. Science historians Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway documented this in detail in their critically acclaimed book, Merchants of Doubt, which shows how powerful campaigns were orchestrated by the right-wing political and corporate establishment to spread doubt and confusion about these scientific findings, even after there was large consensus for them. This book was received favorably by most as an exhaustive and comprehensive work on the history of several scientific issues. It is very much recommended. 
To circumvent being caught by these politically and corporately motivated science smearing campaigns, it is important to dive right into the scientific consensus and the evidence available on the subject, rather than getting distracted by the media's lopsided portrayal of scientific information under the guise that they are providing both sides of the story, even if there is no other legitimate one to a particular claim. Folks, there is no other side to homeopathy being a load of garbage. It has been tested fairly exhaustively, and the studies and meta-analyses are conclusive that it works no better than placebos. There are similar stories regarding various fields in which either the media and or business and or political interests manufacture doubt amongst the public to give the illusion that there is controversy when the science is very much settled. One of the oft-repeated mantra of these confusionists is to recite, there is a need for more research, which, funnily enough, is an effectively banned phrase by the British Medical Journal if it doesn't refer to specifics, since it doesn't add anything meaningful. Such phrases are typically used by those who have not done any research on a subject themselves or researched only anti-consensus positions, and who wish to project their ignorance and incredulity outwards. Then there are perceived skeptic organizations that gather scientists to lobby the public and political apologists to make it seem like there is legitimate scientific controversy about a field. For example, we have the European Network of Scientists for Social and Environmental Responsibility, an anti-GMO group, the International Network of Cholesterol Skeptics, a crank organization that obscures the robust research on cholesterol's role in heart disease, we have the National Vaccine Information Center, an anti-vax group, and architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, and many others. None of these organizations are doing what scientists do when they think they have data that challenges something that's currently accepted as a scientific truth. That is, performing experiments, getting them replicated, getting them published in the very best scientific journals, and trying to convince peer scientists that a shift in perception is needed. This should be a red flag. Are the sources you're using just, just fringe organizations that represent positions that fly in the face of what has been established by the bulk of the evidence in the scientific literature? Moreover, do they try to give you the impression that the bulk of the evidence actually supports their position, despite published experts disagreeing with them? If so, proceed with extreme caution. To give you an example of what scientists do when they think they have found something that challenges the scientific status quo, take the case of Helicobacter pylori. Until the mid-1980s, it was widely believed that stress was the primary cause of stomach ulcers, until Australian scientists Dr. Barry Marshall and Dr. Robin Warren discovered this bacterium, H. pylori, that was present in the stomachs of patients with ulcers. The initial reception of the scientific community was that of skepticism and intense scrutiny, as we should expect and hope for in any scientific field. Yet in time, the scientists were able to demonstrate validity for their hypothesis, and in turn earned the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Future scientific research will undoubtedly continue to update our understandings, refining currently accepted wisdom and seldomly discarding it. But the time to embrace such new understandings is when we can demonstrate it, not before, and not because we can point to other models that have been overturned in the past. This is not to say that we should forfeit our critical thinking skills and automatically and blindly accept the scientific consensus or what the experts say, but it is a very good starting point to thoroughly understand the currently accepted wisdom before considering more minority or fringe positions. Remember, Scientific consensus is what is established by the foremost experts studying, performing research, and publishing in their respective fields. They are the leaders in their fields, and cannot be so casually dismissed simply because an alternate view sounds convincing to us or conforms to our beliefs. Now, you might ask yourself why so many dissonant views exist and why they seem to be so pervasive, at least on the internet. Doesn't this mean scientists have failed in their duty as intellectuals to convince society at large of the validity of the evidence that establishes a scientific consensus? This brings up a related question. 
Should scientists be expending extraordinary efforts to refute all the science denialism or dissident voices that arise on a multitude of subjects? Well, to a degree, scientists have a duty to inform their peers and the public of what the evidence says. But when uninformed citizens, lobby groups, or confusionists make lots of noise about something they are not qualified to assess? Should scientists then be in the hot seat to counter every crank out there? The available evidence on this strongly suggests that they should not be wasting so much time in this endeavor due to something called the backfire effect, as it is unlikely to sway those people who are, who are in the anti-science or pseudoscience camp, and often even reaffirms such positions. Shifting gears a bit, to give you an example of how scientists establish causation between two variables, for example, that smoking causes lung cancer or that high serum cholesterol causes atherosclerosis, let me discuss how this is done. By the way, in science, especially epidemiology, rather than saying one thing causes another, it is generally said that one thing is a risk factor for another, simply because there are no absolutes in science. Science is about constructing models that best represent reality. And since we live in a complex universe with many different variables, one-to-one -one relationships are unusual, again, especially when discussing epidemiology. I'm sure you've heard the truism, correlation is not causation. This is important to remember for two reasons. The first is that many people think that because associations exist between two variables, one must cause the other. But in fact, there may be a third variable that better explains the phenomenon. And the second is that many people wrongfully use this slogan when trying to obscure or confuse, intentionally or not, what is actually a well-established scientific causal understanding between variables. I want to mention two sets of criteria that scientists use to establish causal relationships. The first is known as the Bradford Hill Criteria or Hill's Criteria for Causation. This was developed in the 1960s. If you want, pause the video or make note to go back and go through these yourself. The Bradford Hill Criteria are still widely accepted today as a structure for defining causation in epidemiology. And the second set of criteria is known as Koch's Postulates, which is more generally used in microbiology to establish a relationship between a microbe and a disease. For example, it has been established beyond reasonable doubt that a high plasma cholesterol concentration is a cause of coronary heart disease, using both the, the Bradford Hill criteria and Koch's postulates. Yet there are still confusionists attempting to dispute this with the usual correlation is not causation nonsense or other unsupportable claims. Or another example, the man who formulated Bra the Bradford Hill criteria, Sir Austin Bradford Hill, along with his colleague Sir Richard Dahl, was the first to demonstrate the causal association between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. Funnily enough, the tobacco industry tried to use Koch's postulates to deny the link, even though there's no microorganism involved. I bring this up simply to give you an idea of the tools scientists use to establish causal associations between variables. As I've noticed that a lot of people who invoke the correlation is not causation slogan have no clue what actually can determine causation. Let's continue. Once we've become familiar with the consensus position of experts in any particular scientific field, we may then turn to review the literature that appears in scientific peer-reviewed journals. The peer review process works by having two or more experts in a particular field review the work of another peer. Peer review is employed throughout all of modern science to maintain a high, consistent quality of work that is churned out and published for other scientists to attempt to replicate or refute. A few useful free resources for searching the peer-reviewed scientific literature include the following. Google Scholar, one of the most comprehensive search engines that includes most online journals. CiteSeerX, which specializes in computer and information science. PubMed, a free online search engine of citations, mostly from the Medline database for references and abstracts from life science journals and biomedical topics, and NCBI, a series of databases uh, run as part of the U.S. National Library of Medicine. Those are just a few, but there are many more. 
both free and more specialized ones that you have to pay for. If a scientific issue has been studied to any serious degree, it will appear in peer review in some shape or form, hopefully within a journal that has a high impact factor, which is a measure that reflects the number of citations that recent articles in a journal have. The higher, the more reputable. But we must understand, peer review is just a minimum. Findings in peer review need to be replicated numerous times to ensure accuracy of a finding or model. The more evidence that's generated and the more consistent the findings, the more robust a finding likely is. If we're trying to research the efficacy of a drug, we should search to discover whether any clinical trials have been completed that demonstrate whether a drug has been more successful in its proposed treatment compared to a placebo or older drug. The more successful ones, the better. If we're trying to research a dietary regime, we should review as much of the epidemiological and clinical trial evidence as is available to us. Needless to say, anecdotal evidence is not significant other than leading us to ask a question and develop a, hypoth a hypothesis. Such anecdotes must be robustly corroborated by experimental data. In Tricia Greenhalgh's book, How to Read a Paper, The Basics of Evidence-Based Medicine, she discusses a rough hierarchy of the types of studies to look for when reviewing the literature. At the top are meta-analyses, or systematic reviews of a group of studies within a particular field. These are so valuable because rather than relying on singular studies here and there, researchers will group data together in a large meta-analysis to see how patterns and models hold in the larger picture. The Cochrane collaboration is widely regarded as the gold standard for conducting these types of reviews. The British Medical Journal's Clinical Evidence website presents systematic reviews in easy, quick-to-access formats. It should be noted, however, that the meta-analysis, like all science, is not bulletproof or immune to its flaws. For example, a 2010 meta-analysis in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition unbelievably concluded that there is no significant evidence for concluding that dietary saturated fat is associated with an increased risk of heart disease. This study was found to have serious problems and was immediately criticized for its many methodological and statistical flaws. If a meta-analysis reviews poor studies, the wrong studies, or uses statistical methods that obscure the individual study's findings, the value of such a review is lost. On the odd occasion, through post-publication peer review, Studies that have been accepted into scientific journals will, will later be found to be seriously flawed methodologically, or even fraudulent, and then are often retracted from publication. The website Retraction Watch documents many of these cases. A couple of notable examples. Number one, in 2012, a paper was published in the journal Food and Chemical Toxicology, authored by Seralini et al which allegedly found a relationship between GMO food consumption and the development of tumors in rats. The study made media headlines all over and was heralded as finally the evidence needed to condemn GMO foods as unfit for human consumption. However, the study was met with harsh scrutiny and criticism within the scientific community, including many independent scientists, for the study's fatally flawed methodological design. I won't get into the details here. The study was retracted the next year due to its multitude of problems. However, the news of the study's retraction did not circulate the media anywhere near as much as the original study's publication did and is still used by anti-GMO activists as evidence of GMO foods' negative health effects, despite the hundreds of other pieces of evidence that find no evidence of harm. Number two, in 1998, Andrew Wakefield published what was later found to be a fraudulent research paper in leading journal The Lancet that alleged a causal link between vaccines and the development of autism. Investigations into the paper revealed undisclosed financial conflicts of interest on the part of Wakefield and dozens of counts of dishonesty and irresponsibility. And the whole ordeal was ultimately labeled an elaborate fraud. A multitude of other research has been performed since then that has failed to reproduce the findings and the autism link to vaccines has now been thoroughly discredited and refuted. 
Yet anti-vax proponents credulously still peddle this absolute nonsense that vaccines cause autism, ultimately causing a tragic decline in the vaccine rates in the Western world, which were followed by outbreaks of the disease that the vaccines prevent. As simply a point to consider, why would those who support these indefensible positions have to rely on the worst possible studies in terms of their design and methodologies to prop up their views? Now, for the sake of balance, let's cover some of the problems with the peer review process. Keep in mind that these are simply problems with the current setup, not outright criticisms of science itself or the concept of peer review. At times, the peer review process can be slow and expensive. There can be inconsistency amongst those doing the reviewing, and there is evidence of bias, particularly against women in the awarding of grants. One proposed and now implemented strategy by many more reputable journals to combat these problems of bias is to conduct the peer review process in a double-blind manner, meaning the reviewers are not made aware of who the authors of a submitted article are. This has its pros and cons. With the advent of the internet, there have been many more open access peer reviewed journals launching online, many of them completely unreputable, but claiming to be peer reviewed. And they technically are, but they have demonstrated no reliability or quality in the work they churn out. This was evidenced recently after the big journal Science performed a sting operation on many of these journals and found that many of them will publish fake science for a fee. And just a few years earlier, an experiment was done using SciGen, a program that generates nonsensical computer science papers, and submitted it to one of these open access journals. And it was accepted, obviously casting serious doubt on the reputability of the journal. By the way, this was the same journal that published the paper that alleged the findings of nanothermite in the dust of the World Trade Center towers on 9-11. Another significant problem with the peer review process is when a particular issue is subject to publication bias. This is when, for a variety of reasons, certain studies are left unpublished, leaving a lopsided impression of what the available evidence says. This isn't so much a problem with peer review, but the monetary incentives that motivate pharmaceutical companies to withhold negative trial results from being submitted for publication, and only publish the positive ones. No, this isn't a big pharma conspiracy, it's just business. And just because pharma gets up to some dishonest shenanigans doesn't entitle us to believe in the quackery of alternate medicine. Medical doctor and author Ben Goldacre discusses this problem of publication bias extensively in his book Bad Pharma. For example, the drug Tamiflu cannot be accurately evaluated right now due to many studies being withheld from publication. No, this doesn't mean we get to infer that every field of modern science is scathed with publication bias, thereby casting doubt upon issues that are very much grounded in near complete information. There are ways to detect publication bias, such as the funnel plot. Moreover, there are significant efforts being made to nip in the bud this problem, such as having all clinical trials registered for publication before the results are in, circumventing any motivation to only publish favorable results. And the last issue I'll cover on the problems of peer review is the incentive for scientific misconduct. Whether motivated by the often high pressure on scientists to publish or perish in order to solidify their career reputations or through some sort of business pursuit. A meta-analysis in 2009 on scientific misconduct found that roughly 2% of scientists admitted to having fabricated, falsified, or modified data or results at least once in their careers, but noted that this was likely a conservative estimate. Furthermore, of the nearly 3,500 research institutions that report to the Office of Research Integrity, part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, 3% indicate some form of scientific misconduct. Given the competitive nature of our socioeconomic system, these actually seem surprisingly low to me. These statistical realities about bias and scientific misconduct further reaffirm that our strategy for reviewing the literature must be to take as comprehensive a view as possible. 
It must be said, the peer review process is not perfect. It has recognized flaws and is continually being updated. It is also important to recognize that we absolutely cannot do without this process and that despite its shortcomings, it is the best system we currently have for weeding out bias and discerning scientific truths. At no point should we feel tempted to discard all of science due to the cases of corruption, scientific misconduct, or publication bias. Remember what a risk factor is? A condition that increases risk to a certain disease or consequence? Rather than thinking absolutely that money has corrupted everything, it may be more helpful to think of it such that money is a risk factor for corruption. It by no means guarantees fraud or dishonesty, but it certainly does increase the likelihood. As such, we need to take a case-by-case -case approach and not think in terms of absolutes or get driven by ideology. This brings me to near the end of the talk. To finish off, I want to summarize by describing a final list of steps to take when assessing scientific research. Number one, become familiar with the consensus position. What do the world's leading public health and academic institutions and scientific researchers conclude? Two, take as broad and comprehensive a view as possible, reviewing the scientific literature to see where the weight of the evidence lies. It is almost always in line with the official scientific consensus. Don't get caught up in singular studies that seem to go against the accepted wisdom. The natural world is a very complex thing and there are always confounding factors at play that may skew results. Three, be wary of industry funded studies, such as by the dairy and meat industries in nutrition, pharmaceutical companies in pharmacology, or other organizations that have a financial stake in the research. But don't simply write them off due to funding sources. Take them in context of the entire available literature. Four, ignore media reports that publish the latest and greatest discovery and try to focus on the bigger picture. Again, the media is a news selling institution and the more sensationalized the piece, the more notice people take. Science doesn't work in a way where one day the conventional wisdom is strong and the next day it's completely overturned. Number five, ignore internet bloggers who try to refute well-accepted science. Criticism of established science is not done through blogs. However, blogs can be a decent tool to debunk pseudoscience. In the end, blogs or podcasts or even books should never be primary sources for any information. And six, be very skeptical of qualified professionals who are selling something. This isn't a surefire tactic since many reputable scientists and doctors do sell their books, but there are so many books out there promoting the latest and greatest fad ideas. That's where I'll leave it. I hope this has been helpful for you and even serves as a useful reference in the future when trying to discover what is true. Remember, science is not something that's necessarily easy and quick to understand. If you care about whether your beliefs represent the very best models that have been developed through scientific inquiry, and I truly hope you do, I encourage you to act like a scientist and pursue the very best reasons and evidence that are available. Thank you.